Hello and welcome to tonight's edition of The Factor Review, a weekly roundup of the biggest stories shaping Mongolia. Here with us tonight, commentator and economist Jargal De Facto. Good evening. Welcome. And I am Milena Mendes. Um, we're live on Facebook at V Television, and also we love to hear your thoughts. So on Twitter, use hashtag, hashtag Jargal underscore De Facto. Coming up on the show tonight. Investigations have been opened upon former and current finance ministers of Mongolia. Mongol Bank cuts interest rates as head banker rejects caps on commercial bank rates. Incident between a group of Mongolian wrestlers and police for a second stop occurred just outside of the wrestling palace. Neither milk nor sea buckthorn juice, coffee is growing as Mongolian's favorite drink. We're going to start talking about the corruption investigation. Um, Anti-corruption officers have opened investigations into Mongolia's current and former finance minister, putting graft within Mongolia's financial system at center stage. Ex-finance minister Sun Gonjav Bayertog has been linked by Swiss authorities to a $10 million wire transfer bank from a bank account they've seized. Bayertog, who was a finance minister, um, who as a finance minister was a chief negotiator in the 2009 investment agreement from the oil Torga mine, appeared back in Mongolia this last week from his studies abroad to actually defend his innocence. Meanwhile, Unundur, Unundur paper, um, paper last week reported that another investigation had been opened into the current finance minister Chimed Hurilbatar over an alleged sale of mining license to a South Korean company. However, neither the independent agency of corruption nor the government and governing administration have confirmed the report. The investigations have put doubt onto the investment agreement for Aryutolgo, and some lawmakers think it needs review. Hurul Bater's investigation might have a similar impact on his stirring of the economy out of economic troubles along with the $5.5 billion economic bailout from the International Monetary Fund, which is, being, which is becoming increasingly unpopular because of the austerity it requires. So, Jargal, I have one question for you now. What details can you please give us about the investigations into Bayerzog and Hurul Bater? Well, one investigation is being made by Swiss authority. There is attorney general, uh, attorney, gen, uh, attorney general office of Switzerland and Mongolian anti-corruption agency together doing that investigations. Of course, the final result of the investigation is still to come. But before that, we cannot much uh, speculate on that. What's clear was Mr. Bayer uh, talked himself made press conference after that release of news, and he said that he had borrowed uh, $10 million from well-known large uh, businessmen in Mongolia. And he has been using the money for business purposes, and uh, then the remaining, the balance, 1.8 million US dollar in the account is frozen. <clears throat> and he said that it's good that two authorities are doing it together so that he really gets the proof that he was not receiving any money from OT. That's what he said. Concerning the current Minister of Finance, he was accused by his party member also, a parliament member and ex-government uh, uh, chancellor, Mr. Munkpat, he was blaming that he had sold the, the license of a particular place from his uh, province to uh, uh, foreign investors in cooperation together with his brothers. He had completely refused that and now he himself, according to him, had asked the anti-corruption agency to check it. So now the issue on that current minister is coming the following. Either one of them is lying. lying yeah. So in any case, whoever is lying, if we prove that lying, one of them is lying, right? We will prove, we should prove one of them is lying, one of them at fault truly, then uh, the, the person who is lying should have a certain responsibility, should have meet certain responsibility, punishment kind of. Because if it is true, 
then Mr. Hurzbater has to report to the country what is the how, how come on, that the former minister of finance he was also a former minister of finance how he could misuse like this if he is not uh, he, if he is right and he hasn't done any so then the other person should have for defaming a person particular high ranking political officials so that guy should have a responsibility uh, but however I have a you know many cases happening like this blaming each other at the end we don't know exactly what happened yeah so because that this sort of things is happening because that of conflict of interests because of this big some this sort of big money is in questions uh, people start to less believe in the government it is it is a matter of the uh, institutions capacity of the mongolian government so it's a matter of conflict of interests. It is not disclosure of that interests, or misusing public fund, etc. So these are a part of uh, issues that Mongolia whole society faces, and we should we need to increase quality of our governance. We should uh, increase capacity of institutions. We should through through clear investigation of these matters. We should make the government better, transparent and are predictable. That's what is uh, the agenda of Mongolian society today. <laughs> it's a long agenda for sure. And in your opinion, should these corruption investigations cast doubt on these agreements between Ayatollah and also the bailout uh, agreement? <clears throat> well, this is very serious questions because if this joint investigation proves that Mr. Bayerzokht got the money before from particular sources for before making that uh, big historic large contract for Mongolia with uh, uh, the on Oyu Tadre, if he had if they proved that he got received, then it's a matter of definitely of reconsidering all contract. This sort of large contract, if it is made through like corruption system, no country, nobody will accept it. But however. If it is proved that it has nothing to do with an uh, OT-related party and it has just his own money, he will have responsibility only for having uh, this big money abroad and doing business at the same time uh, when he was a public oh, my, officer. Yeah. So if to, in, in any case, this is the questions that Mongolian society will follow. It's a, it's a very important issue for us because it's the largest now so far the corruption scandal we receive. Right. And, you know, we've, we're always talking about corruption here on the show because, of course, that's something that's always happening here in Mongolia. So how does this um, demonstrate the negative consequences of corruption on the economy? What are the biggest... Well, no, the, the, the biggest problem with Mongolia is today is a corruption. And corruption comes... The, the source of corruption is the political party financing. And uh, those two political parties who are running the country, they take powers either in coalition or alone. These two political parties are never disclosing true picture of their financing. And they keep receiving a large sum of uh, money from individuals, from companies, uh, let on they serve for them. So through this system, unfortunately, this non-transparent non system, uh, people buy the state powers. So that's why corruption is the key obstacle that we should address and eliminate if we want to go in normal development path. Right, I'm right there with you. And moving on to our next topic of the night, the Bank of Mongolia on Friday cut its policy interest rate by one percentage point to 10%, the second reduction in three months, as it seeks to stimulate an economy recovering from a 2016 financial crisis. B. Bayardava, director of the Bank of Mongolia's Monetary Poli Policy Department, said that the inflation was below its target level, the annual inflation rate was 6.9%. The target for this year is 8%. Meanwhile, the president of the central bank this week rejected a bill that would restrict loan rates at commercial banks from giving above 18%, from going above 18%, I'm sorry. Mongolia currently, currently has some of the highest interest rates 
in the world. Also on Friday, the central bank reduced the reserve requirement ratio for commercial banks to 10.5% of two work deposits from 12%. So what does this mean for lending rates here in Mongolia? This uh, so-called uh, banking po po policy rate, which is now 10%, gives a more, uh, more more wish for commercial banks to invest into uh, in, in, into the business, into the economy, to give a more loan. But it is not that substantial change from 11 to 10. Uh, that, that interest rate, when the saving rate is about 15 percent, loan rate is over 20 percent. So, uh, and uh, this makes because it will not well, it will give that trend to the direction to give him more the wish to give more loan. Yes, it will give because it is now 1% cheaper okay. here to keep in the, in the account of uh, central bank the money of uh, the re remaining money, balance money from the bank that is available for loan. They can uh, keep it for 10% with the 10% in, uh, in, the, in, the coffin of, in the account of central bank. But does it make substantial change? No. Uh, but direction is correct. And because the loan rate is so high in the country, as you said, our, we don't see the thriving businesses in Mongolia. It's very hard to have a business with 25% interest rate just it's to give high. to the bank. Yeah. So that's why the, 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 that's why the private uh, sector of Mongolia is kind of shrinking because they have no access to cheaper money. Only large companies have access and they go, they borrow the money from abroad or through the representative offices of other commercial banks based in Mongolia. So this, is, this economy is still to, the, we, still we to make a lot of things to have the credit loan rate down first. And without making money accessible to the ordinary businesses, the economy cannot be thriving. It will be still depending on the commodity prices which, 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 which is more, has to do with more state budget size. Uh, <clears throat> so, on the other hand, you said about uh, the last December, the last change of the rate. And within the three months, if it is increased or not, uh, is a business increased or not, is a separate question. Because, because our, the weather conditions, winter is so cold, through and small medium enterprise business go usually from spring through summer to the late to the late uh, fall so we will see exactly what was the result of the last year 1% decrease but now what they are changing is because uh, the financial strength situation is a little bit changing because we receive more now foreign aid money and also from uh, foreign uh, public money, which is cheaper than commercial price, commercial commercial money, commercial bond. So, in in, in that way, a little bit, it's easing the the burden of interest rate of foreign money. But though still we are keep paying Mongolian government bond with new bond. So the situation is more or less stable, but it doesn't mean that we go with the less foreign debt. We're still in in in, in a foreign, in very deep in a foreign debt. We, we don't know clearly how the, our economy can afford keep paying back. So this, because it's the payment time is extended, so we don't know, we are not thinking about that so far, <laughs> in particular at least the government. So I don't think this whole thing makes loan rate so fast. Let me ask Down. you, what is your opinion? Why do you think that the president of the central bank is against capping rates at commercial banks? What are the pros for him? Well, uh, yes, he is against because uh, capping the loan interest rate never brought a clear, clear result in history. Positive results. Yes, because because you cannot establish or make a particular roof for the interest rate, which is regulated by supply and demand. Uh, the other countries who have tried, many countries have tried, over 80 countries have tried, mm -hmm. they had always side effects 
even in the U.S., now when they make a cut, a cap of the interest rate, then it will be less. Uh, the fund will be less available for, say, small and medium enterprises. People are not interested because they risk higher in many factors. So, interest rate, like uh, commercial rate, like many prices, cannot be regulated or set by government resolutions. It should be by supply and demand, the market law. And only the market regulation makes that, you know, extra things gone, and so that more slim, more stronger private sector goes ahead after losing, for example, if a company is bankrupt, should be bankrupt. Mm -hmm. So the, why the whole country should pay for a bankruptcy policy of one company, for example, or one bank? If it's bankrupt, it should be bankrupt. This is the way how uh, many politicians don't think that mm -hmm. it is the best way. Right. And can you please help explain to our viewers who might be a little confused, how does that impact on inflation here in Mongolia? Well, inflation is an issue of supply and demand as well. Mm -hmm. Prices goes up, down, depending on the availability of any things on one side. Uh, though the supply can demand also go down, but the demand goes down also because maybe people have more busy with, uh, for example, new trend. Now we have very artificial mortgage loan. People more busy with their money is with the mortgage, expensive mortgage, and they are buying less and less. As a result, the price, because demand is less, keeps... keeps increasing. Uh, no, demand is less. Demand if it's high, it's keep increasing. If demand is less, the prices stay there or yeah. go down. So that's the major reason of the inflation staying at the level of 6.5%. I remember there was even uh, double, triple digit uh, inflation 20 years ago. So more or less economy is less, le less dependent on the sort of fluctuations now of prices. Uh, but however, 8%, 6 5% 6 is okay. Usually economy, if it is with the level of 2%, economy is regarded normal. I see. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, again, we love to hear your thoughts. So comment on our Facebook page and also on Twitter. And we're going to move on to our next topic. Wrestlers, a group of Mongolian wrestlers clashed with police officers at the wrestling palace this past Friday. According to witnesses, an incident occurred when wrestlers tried to prevent officers from entering the General Executive Agency of Court Decisions in central Ulaanbaatar. According to one source, the officers were attempted to hand over a court decision invalidating a 2017 Congress of the Wrestling Association where El Chimbat was elected as its leader of the association. So Jargal, what was the start of this conflict and why mm. is the court stepping to giving orders to a private um, institution? Th this our wrestling palace story because wrestling palace was made by donations and suddenly the this racist association owns and runs that palace which is a big cash flow machine now because it is not only racist palace it's the one of the largest of two concert halls in the country. So because this big turnover of cash, there is a big business interest in, in the running of this palace. And uh, the, another group of wrestlers who is against just is when the palace is run not transparently, they want to have more transparent, mm -hmm. they, they, so this sort of decision is happening, they are demanding different conditions of running, etc. And it's ongoing battle for long, quite some years. Now, finally, they want to take over. The son of that uh, person who had to stamp everything, they said, he, because he's a sick, he cannot accept them now. So this sort of fight shows that how NGO is run in the country. What is the private property or common property, public property? So this, this palace is Whole, everybody, whole, this whole rest is property, donated by, made by donations. And this is one issue. The secondly also we had an issue with the uh, horse racing in the country. They made a horse racing 
uh, against uh, government decisions or without government decisions to do so. So last week we had a horse racing which caused 16 children uh, injured. Usually children are the runner of the horse, rider of the horse. So all this both shows that our traditional sports like wrestling, like a horse, uh, horse racing. racing are becoming a kind of too much subject of business, making money, in spite of it causes a damage or sometimes a life loss of children. So it both this incident show that we need more clear rules and because it's also kind of all this what's happening is a reflection of our today's current value of the society. And these sports are used to help us to Mong Mongolians to shape up our inner world to make us more competitive. And instead this sort of thing is happening and so people now are very unhappy watching the two developments at the same time. And you know what, yesterday there was another congress held. Um, can you please tell us what happened there or do you know what the latest are? Uh, well, they this racers associations had a con congress that was long time planned and they finally elected uh, replaced their leader the president of the associations with Mr. Batirden who who is a parliament member and very well known champion of the Mongolian racing for many years so he is the figure that knows about the sport because it was his sport i mean but however, he is also a parliament member. So some concern says that how come the head of uh, the member of parliament can be a head of NGO. So yes, one can be, but in the conditions, under the conditions that all things should be transparent. So all these conflicts, fights are happening because not transparency in money, revenue and spending, not clear accountability not clear report, systematic report on the financial and other activities of this NGO, which is, uh, which is turning big money into the business. That's why. <laughs> well, we have to move on to our next topic of the night. And I have a question for you. What is your favorite morning drink? Jargal, what is your favorite morning drink? <laughs> Coffee. <laughs> Coffee, okay, because this matches our last topic. Some young Mongolians have put down their teacups and picked up mugs of coffee brew instead. More than half of all Mongolians between 15 and 60 surveyed in a 2016 study said that they drink coffee, while Mongolians spend about 3 billion tugruks on coffee per year. According to the study by Mongolia Marketing Consulting LLC, 73% of Mongolians drink instant coffee, 20% medium coffee, and the remainder espresso drinks, the National Survey, the National Survey said. Coffee imports rose to 93.9 per tones last year, 2017. So, Jargo, Five years ago, there were only a handful of coffee shops in Mongolia, but now every street, at least downtown in Mongolia, there is, there is a, uh, a franchise. So how did this catch up so quickly? Well, it's it's index of how Mongolia is coming with, with the general trend in the world. People are traveling a lot. I think we are one of the traveling nations compared to populations, and people now you know, with all this modern communication means, social media, everything, people's communication ways being changed. And that's one of them, because coffee is not only just drink, right. it's a culture. In particular, those uh, uh, coffee shops you are referring to are places for people, in particular for young people to come to meet and to work. Because each coffee shop, you know, competition is a good thing each coffee shop in a way competing with Starbucks, which is not in Mongolia yet. Yeah. But, uh, but I think for Starbucks, the size of uh, too small, the many the requirements more. But other coffee chains, coffee drinking, coffee, p p co coffee offering, uh, coffee shops uh, being a lot here now introduced. It's good, you know, at times the, I was writing once that uh, we have more drug stores, apteca we call it, drug stores for medicine 
more than coffee shops. So <laughs> now I think they are about the par at the yeah. same level. And uh, this is not only uh, also a lot we spend in 3 billion Tugriks for 3 million people is also quite impressive statistics. And yet it's only 10% of them using uh, the, uh, the, the coffee shops coffee because where they don't serve the instant coffee. Instant coffee is a long culture since Russian time. Since 50s, I think, I first time come to Mongolia, and people were using it instant coffee uh, mostly. Mm -hmm. But the, the, exactly the coffee shop coffee is coming more broader, and um, hopefully more communications as well. <laughs> well, how about the traditional tea drinking culture? Because here in Mongolia, if you know what I'm talking about. The milk tea is big, sea buckthorn juice is big. Yeah, uh, in particular this uh, milk tea with salt, uh, we, with, it comes with the tea that is produced in Georgia. Traditionally it was like this, and we have been uh, mixing it, um, we drink it hot, right? And this is kind of greetings in Mongolia with tea. So in our culture, you should cre greet every guest with tea. Uh, without that, that will be in shock. It will be a very unfriendly gesture if you don't offer tea. Uh, so this culture is there. And anyway, if you go in particular in the countryside, the first things they will give you, they will offer you tea with milk. And I don't think this culture will disappear. It's like a part of our culture. Yeah. So, and along with that, it comes with now coffee. So. Uh, but for many uh, urban families, now in particular settled in the center, in this area, they uh, tend to drink now not milk tea, but coffee, or water, or juice, or uh, sibakdarn. How's that going in your house? Uh, we drink coffee <laughs> and uh, rarely tea. What this uh, this normal tea, uh, the the European in the sense tea. Mm -hmm. And uh, many families go in that way, I understand. Right. Well, we're coming to the end of tonight. So, Jargal, do you have any last thoughts on these topics or a comment to our viewers? Well, uh, <clears throat> I was last week in, uh, uh, as international observer at the election in the Russia. And I wrote uh, what I observed in Mongolian. And that my uh, English translation will be on Tuesday. And it will be in our newspaper called De Facto Gazeta, which you can, uh, which you can, free subscription on your on our website to your email. So you go jargaldefacto.com. They will ask you, do you want to subs subscribe weekly newspaper with our um, this review and our article in English, Mongolian, and Japanese. So please select one of those or all of three <laughs> and uh, write our, uh, read our newspaper. Thank you. Well, again, if you missed the beginning of the show, don't worry. We're live on Facebook and the show stays on the Facebook page V Television. Thank you very much for staying with us tonight. I'm Elena Mendes and I hope you have a great week. Bye-bye, Mongolia. Good night.